you know? All right. All right. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak to up to about an hour or so on her uh, speech. Then we'll have our question and answer period. And after our question and answer period, we'll then have our infamous rebuttal period where you can rebut the speaker on or off topic. You'll each get a certain amount of set up on the time. And after that, we can then, uh, you know, we'll close out the meeting about nine o'clock or so. And if you want to stick around and chat for a while, I'll keep it open until, you know, the cows come home or whatever. But uh, we usually get some, some things in. So the formal proceedings will end about roughly about nine o'clock. And again, there's two rules to the college that we'd like to adhere to. One is no personal attacks and one is one fool at a time. And, uh, I'd like to welcome Bob and Raj and everybody else tonight, Makeda and uh, Michael. So Charlie, if you want to take it away with the announcements, uh, go ahead. All right. Welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3,644 of the College of Complexes. The playground for people who think. First of all, we have a Google email group and a meetup group, which both function pretty much the same way. If you sign up for these email groups, you'll get one or two bulletins uh, announcing uh, the upcoming program of the week. There's not much traffic on them. I highly recommend you join either one or both as I have done. Okay, uh, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On December the 4th, the Chief Executive Director, uh, Jen Walling, will be from the Illinois Environmental Council We'll be here to talk about ecological legislation uh, in the state of Illinois at uh, General Assembly. Uh, should be a good program. On December the 11th, a program that perhaps everyone should attend is the Center of Pluralism, in which a gentleman will tell us on how to discuss issues with difficult people. I'm an expert on that. I should give that talk. But I didn't know, but seriously, it's a very interesting uh, upcoming program on December the 11th, turning to December the 18th. Reverend Charlie Earp, a friend of mine, will give a presentation. He has instituted a, the Church of the Revolution. Uh, it's intersectional, eco-socialist, religious communism. Can't get any better than that. <laughs> December the 18th. <laughs> On January the 8th, a group that I've been involved in um, for ecological communities is in an organization called America Walks, and they are pedestrian advocacy groups. Uh, so that should be a hot one. You people are automobile uh, aficionados. January the 8th. On January the 15th, the Libertarian Party <laughs> will be returning uh, with a visual program trying to convince you of the merits yes. of libertarianism yeah. and individual liberties. Come on. On, January the 15th. Yeah. on January the 22nd, the Alliance for a Just Society. I know me. all of you huh? are for justice. Come on. So, uh, January 22nd, the Alliance for Justice Society, okay, I'm not. A group out, out of New York, uh, will okay, be going gotcha. to so, right. go 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 Why don't you silence Raj? I did. Okay, January the 29th. Now, this is a should be a good program. Everyone should be interested in this one. But this is the Farm Workers, an organization. They call themselves kind of a, a little difficult name, the Amokali Workers. But these are tomato pickers. 
and they got a boycott Wendy's campaign. I hope none of you are going to Wendy's these days. And I know you're all joining us in a boycott of that nefarious uh, food chain. But anyhow, they're going to have some speakers of uh, tomato pickers themselves, and it'll be, it'll be translated from Spanish into English, telling us about the farm worker conditions. January 29th. On February, then we move into February. Oh, this is a good talk. All about the Democratic Party. Um, and how we've got to combat the surrender of democracy. We've given away democracy. Um, but anyhow, that's uh, on February the 5th. And last of all, the next open date will be February the 12th. If you would like to speak to the College of Complexes yourself. Thank you very much. Take it away, Tim. All right. Uh, tonight's speaker will be Jean Lee. And Jean, since you uh, are going to be speaking, I'll let you introduce yourself. Again, uh, I'm asking everybody to mute while our speaker speaks. And then afterwards, we'll uh, unmute and open our questions up. Roger, I did mute you, by the way, because of some extra noise. But th that's no problem. You know how to do the unmute. And uh, if we're ready to go, Shean, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. I have prepared a uh, PowerPoint, so I will start share screen. Yes, Shean, we can see it. Don't forget to go to full screen in the okay. slideshow icon. Okay. I'll, I'll do the slideshow show icon. It will be okay, start from... presenter view. I'll, no, no, I'll no. You can see, I see the presenter view, but you see the full view, right? No, we actually see the whole thing. Oh, okay, okay, okay. We'll go so back. Guess, what you want to do is go uh, to slideshow. Okay. I'll just from the reg regular slideshow, I guess. Uh, car no, no, no. You want to go to okay. 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 Um, the space bar will advance. Okay. I prefer to manually advance. Okay, so um, I will uh, introduce myself in terms like how I come up with this topic as I go along. Let me see, how do I go to next page? You got it already, you're there. Okay, so my rationale for this top topic I, um, I have a PhD in anthropology and I was teaching anthropology at the College of Charleston, South Carolina from 1993 to 1993. And Charleston, South Carolina um, has a historical society, very active historical society. And there's a magazine called South Carolina Historical Magazine. And one of my colleagues said, um, there's, there, there, there was a small group of uh, uh, Chinese community in, in um, Charleston for over a hundred years, but there's no uh, research on this group. And he suggested if I could do um, a study. So I took up that challenge and did a historical study of the Chinese in Charleston. And it became very interesting in the sense that uh, <coughs> in a segregated South, usually the picture is like black and white. So the Chinese doesn't fit into this black and white um, um, mold. Um, it's a very small community. So as I did research, I um, like I was able to interview some descendants of the uh, first group of the um, Chinese immigrants, um, and I did um, some. I collected firsthand materials from from census, city directory, and talking, interviewing. And now um, this is a very sensitive topic, so I thought we could uh, take a historical view and I'll end with my reflections on race, racial ideas and racism. Um, 
So my uh, research questions uh, for that particular study was what, uh, what, what is the perceived color of the Chinese Americans in the segregated South before the 1960s? Were there racial discrimi discriminations against the Chinese Americans? If there were, how were they manifested? What are the lessons can we draw from this study? Uh, of course, my research and reflections on race, racial ideas and racism, and I will put that at the end. Um, so some of you may have um, already know about this Jim Crow laws between 86, 70s and 1965. And this uh, is historically very significant because uh, even when I was doing the research, I was uh, presented with this black and white um, manifestation in the city directories there was the, the city directory before 1965 uh, had a white section and a colored section. Of course, you know the, the schools and bathrooms and all these, they um, had two separated um, sections. Uh, of course, it was under the pretense separate but equal. In practice, it separate was true, but equal not true. Um, if I highly recommend you to watch that movie called The Green Book. Um, it's a very insightful book, and it's uh, also kind of entertaining. That shows how the um, racial segregation uh, worked in the South. It has the movie has won several Oscar awards, and I learned and enjoyed that movie. Um, I don't see the whole screen because I I'm looking. I see okay. 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 I have to move move the the people. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I move 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 on this side. Um, so the Chinese being neither black nor white provides an interesting case study to see how the race, relation, race relations and racism will play out in the South. Um, this table uh, was taken from the city directory, but it's kind of blurred. I have made another table with more um, cl clearer view. Um, as you see, that there, there was a, a directory for Chinese businesses in Charleston from 1870 to 1973. Well, that's actually, I put them together um, through lifting, uh, going through all these uh, directories. I put them through and, and it's published in the uh, Charleston Historical Society. Um, so this is a clearer view of the, uh, the, the kind of businesses Chinese Americans uh, were engaged. There were not many, but it's kind of giving you a historical perspective. Uh, so usually the new immigrants, especially the Chinese, were engaging um, these laundry, restaurant, gro grocery stores uh, throughout the country. Uh, but in Charleston, uh, um, it, in Charleston, there, there are very few uh, restaurants uh, or grocery stores, but a lot of laundries. Um, not a lot, but that's just because <coughs> of the so small. So uh, you can see even as early as 1880 to 1889, there are one to five uh, laundry uh, and then um, there, there are quite a few until uh, 1970s, 1960s. Um, by the 1960s, the rise of washing machine um, kind of um, drove that need for, for uh, laundry and there were just fewer. Um, and this is uh, a newspaper, um, article about the description of these, um, these, these uh, Chinese la la laundromat uh, owners. And they talk about 
they um, they worked very hard all year round. Uh, the only day they have off is is uh, celebrating their Chinese New Year. Um, and at that time, they still wanted to go back to their native land, many of them. Um, some fi findings uh, in terms of like what, what um, I mentioned, uh, Chinese being neither black and white, but that two sections. In the city direction, there's only like white. Uh, some it's usually like white, black. So how would Chinese fit into that classification system? Um, I looked through uh, from 80, 80s to 1960s. Uh, um, the Chinese, uh, Charleston Chinese have been classified as white or colored or Mo Mongolian uh, in census. Uh, it's not consistent. It's not consistent, not only in the uh, city directory, it's also not consistent in the census, it's not consistent in other uh, southern cities and states. Um, sometimes they were classified as white, sometimes they're colored. Um, and after three marriage licenses yeah. found in the probate court of Charleston, one Chinese man married a white woman, another married an African woman, and a third married a woman of brown color. Um, so there's uh, some variations in terms of um, classification. Um, I was able to interview, um, I'll show you this picture. So like this picture was taken, um, when I was doing this research, the two um, two ladies um, oh, they of brown color, their their grandfather were uh, Chinese. Um, their grandfather was Chinese, married a kind of interracial uh, woman, very light skinned interracial woman, and their uh, their parents were also light skinned, um, but. In the US, we have a, um, we're still kind of use this one drop of blood. If you have like one drop of blood of uh, black, blackness, African American her heritage, you are considered a as black. But in reality, they had some Caucasian um, background, Chinese, black. But, but by the time I interviewed them, they, consider themselves as uh, Afro-Chinese. Um, and that was the first time I heard the term Afro-Chinese. And you probably can see some traces of Afro-Chinese. And uh, you can find me, <laughs> I was younger. Um, and the, this lady is an artist. Uh, uh, she has Chinese ancestry. And she did an art exhibition of uh, laundromat. So come back to this picture. Um, and this is like the two, two <coughs> sisters I interviewed, oh, afro Chinese. Oh, I showed you the picture. And I, I, uh, I did some historical study. And then I called and I tried to find descendants to talk, talk with so that um, these two uh, have some pictures and recollections of um, their parents and grandparents and uncles and cousins and nieces experiences. So I was able to get some firsthand material. Uh, so the first picture on the top, you can see in the middle as a, um, a Chinese man and Whoa. next to him as a, well, probably it's hard to see. I would say a mix. Um, she is not 100% Caucasian, not 100% African, but by usual standard in the South, uh, she will be considered as black. And that's the, the, the sun, uh, the sun. And these, these um, were uh, the, in the middle, actually in the middle is the mother. Uh, see, she's light-skinned, um, and, and then the two uh, sisters. 
two sisters, and that's the two sisters up here when I interviewed them. They were third generation. So some findings from uh, a history of the Chinese in Ch Charleston. One of the questions I had was, um, would the Chinese uh, descendants um, go to white school or black school? Uh, it was very hard to find um, because, because the ones I interviewed, so I, inter I was able to interview two families in some depths. Um, the, the, the one family is this uh, Long, Charlie Long, Mammy Long, uh, Long family, L-U-M, Long family. Um, they, they were considered as black by, by the locals. Um, so most of them went to black school uh, one of the relatives, cousins or nie nieces, uh, the family and children were very light-skinned. So there was such a thing at that time called pass. Uh, some, um, some Blacks, they were, uh, these are not very accurate terms, but I have to kind of use them uh, in this context. So the, the, the background I mentioned, there is this one drop blood um, theory. If you have one drop of black blood, then you are considered as black, but they also have some Caucasian and Chinese. So the um, skin color can vary from relatives. Some were lighter, almost like as pale as white. Some are darker. So the darker ones, they will have to go to the black school. And if they are wealthy, they go to the local black private school. Um, if they were appear to be light and white, they can pass and go to white school. So they told me a story of the one of the uh, one, one of the relatives that that family was very light and they tried to pass and go to uh, white school. Um, they, in order to be successful to go to white school, the white public school is better than the black private school. So they try to go to this white, white school and in order to go to the white school, they have to uh, make a decision to distance themselves from uh, uh, relatives who are darker uh, and they also uh, go to a church that's not associated with um, African-Americans. And they were able to go to white school for a couple of years until someone um, reported to the school that they are, they are actually, um, they were black and they have relatives were black. And after the, the school received the report, um, they were expelled from the white school. Um, so that's from the Long's family and their um, experiences. And then I was able to talk to a person um, is like pure Chinese by the name Robert Miller. Um, Robert Miller. So this is Robert uh, Miller's family. Um, when I um, talked to him, he was already in his 80s. Uh, his biological parents uh, were Chinese, um, and you see the name Chu Chao Chu Lily. Um, the biological parents left um, the U.S. and went back to China, um, but this uh, boy, he didn't want to go back. He was already staying with the foster parents, who probably were kind of relatives relatives, not the foster mother, but foster father was also Chinese. Um, so he uh, stayed and he lived with the foster parents. Uh, I, I'm not sure how he got the name Robert Miller uh, to be uh, more accepted by the mainstream. Um, her, the, the, the mother was actually German uh, the father was 
Chan, Chinese. Um, he told me, um, he actually had two names, like a name that he just used, uh, Robin Miller, but probably in a more formal documents, he would use his last name, more Chinese last name. name. Um, I, um, so when I was able to talk to him, I was like excited. I wanted to know which school did you go to? Did you go to white school or black school? And he told me he never went to school. He was homeschooled. Um, and I asked him, why did you, um, why were you homeschooled? And he said he was homeschooled because his parents said he was sickly most of the time and it's better to, to be homeschooled. And then I was uh, able to interview another lady, a Caucasian lady in her 80s. And she said, oh, I remember this Chinese boy I used to like be friends uh, when we were really like in elementary school. But then I heard um, just like when they uh, were probably started to go to middle school. And uh, she said, I heard the school said like, uh, the white school wouldn't accept the Chinese um, to the white school. So in a way, um, his parents, that's what I uh, later I put down is ignorance of bliss because he was never told the re real reason he uh, didn't go to school. His parents probably wanted to shield him from racism. Uh, just like their family was relatively well off. They owned a farm. So um, he was homeschooled and he never knew why, but I was able to talk to someone who remembered him and told me he was not accepted by the white school. Um, so this picture uh, at the bottom right is his biological parents. And a picture on the top of uh, uh, the right corner is the, uh, the foster parents. You see the lady as uh, Caucasian, um, fa father was Chinese. Uh, he was pure Chinese because that's his parents. Um, and he also told me incidences of his parents they, they owned a farm and they have like uh, farm hands and farm ha hands will be uh, black. And uh, his parents discouraged him to play with uh, black kids. Um, but the town also uh, has a citadel. And at the time there was uh, um, some uh, Chinese cadets attending the citadel. And his parents were uh, very encouraging him to get to know the Chinese uh, uh, cadets because these are kind of like uh, well-to-do from well-to-do families, uh, very much like elite. So his parents encouraged him to get to know the cadets uh, from China. Uh, that was in the 1930s. Uh, by the end, he, he worked in Charleston Navy Shipyard um, from 96 to 1982, and he is position, he got GS-11 as a general supervisor. Um, <coughs> so um, now I just come to a little bit more theoretical aspect of this. The fluidity of the concept of, of race. Um, the, the Jim Crow's laws uh, laid out strict segregation based on the skin color, but that's mostly black and white. Uh, the, the status of Chinese, is, um, since it's neither black nor, nor white, if a small population like locals, they didn't really know how to ca ca categorize them. So um, they are very, so for this kind of uh, uh, the status of the Ch Chinese, very, they, their status are more uh, based on their socioeconomic um, status. If they are only 
uh, if they were poor, they are more likely to be regarded as uh, closer to black. But if they were uh, wealthy, and especially wealthy and well-educated, they were more accepted by the, uh, by the mainstream uh, whites. For the quotation I have here uh, was from a, another um, Caucasian middle class, higher than middle class um, lady who were talking about um, the cadets from China. Um, the cadets from China were very well received. They were very well educated from well-to-do families. That's why when I asked, him, I asked her about the status of those Chinese and she said, only poor whites, ignorant people might have treated them differently. As far as I know, they were treated as whites. Those are the cadets. Although the Chinese in the laundry were probably treated as second class. Um, so that's how that concept of race was played out for the Chinese at that time. Now, um, I come back and reflect on this race concept. Is it biological or social construction? And I uh, put these pictures together as um, two, these two pictures as I already showed you, they're Chinese in Cha Cha Charleston and their status were not well-defined. Um, but the second or third generation, um, they, they usually they, they are regarded as uh, black. Um, and, and of course, you know, all these, these three famous pictures. And uh, we usually say uh, Obama is the first African-American president, but it's not really scientific. If, if you think scientifically, in a sense that um, like the genes, genetic background, educational background, all these things uh, combined, um, Obama uh, mother is uh, Caucasian and she is actually PhD anthropologist um, who met his, his father from Kenya and his father is a PhD in economics and that's how they met. So genetically, Obama is 50% white, 50% black. And also uh, Obama, he actually was brought up from his maternal side rather than, than his father's side. He spent less than a year or two years in all his life with his father, but he spent most of his time and he was raised by uh, his father mother and his uh, grandparents on the mother's side. So his life experience, he went to um, schools in Hawaii, uh, kind of more mixed schools in Hawaii. And then he went to Columbia and was at Harvard, all those elite uh, schools. His education, his uh, really life experiences actually, as far as I know, is more close to, to the white than black, but because of that kind of tradition of like, we, we think if you're half, half, or even if you're one third genetically, you are more likely to be classified as um, African, as black. Um, and uh, Kamala Harris, her um, parents were India, and um, Jamaica, um, but she was also like she's Indian, Asian Indian, um, and both of her parents also PhD and professors and highly educated. Um, but because she she appears to be darker, um, she's also considered as black African American. But actually, um, it's not quite um, scientific, um, it's not in, so uh, the third, uh, third picture, uh, Woods, Tiger Woods, 
And he, he gave himself a, a name. Now I, I have to move, see if I can move. Um, he has um, just too many things. He, he said he's a Kabbalist nation. So his, his, his parents and grandparents has um, uh, heritage from Caucasian, Black, American, uh, uh, Black, um, and American Indian, and Asian, like Philippines and Chinese. Um, so he is like all, has all these backgrounds. But when we look at him, most people think like he's Black. But he, he could have as much Caucasian and Native American and Asian in him. But in our vocabulary system, we still inherit that um, bias perception that if you have even one job of Black um, heritage, then you're considered as Black. So in that sense, I would say race is more social construction than biology. Um, now I'll go into a more detail, a little bit more detail of the, the theory aspect, race, biological or social construction, uh, race and genetics, IQ and the bell curve theory, anthropological perspective on race. Uh, since I've limited time, I'm not going to go anything in detail, just give you a general uh, outline. Um, broad consensus across the bio biological and the social sciences. That's from more like scientists working in this field. Um, cons broad consensus doesn't mean 100%, but most people who work in this field recognize that humans are rec remarkably genetically similar, sharing approximately 99.9% .9 of the genetic code with one another, or with one so-called race and another. The white individual variations in phenotype, such as skin color, phenotype is the the, the visible um, aspect of the gene expression. So skin color is an uh, example of the phenotypical variations arises from both genetic differences and complex gene environment in interactions. The vast majority of this genetic variation occurs within group or within the races. Very little genetic variations differences between groups or races, which means um, within the Caucasians, there are a lot of genetic variations or within Asians or Africans, what we consider as a race, um, there are actually a lot of variations. So there's in, in um, genetics, there is this phenotype and uh, genotype. The genotype is, is the genetic variations that that are not visible to the naked eyes. Um, but in the genetic studies that they can say, they can see there are uh, actually a lot of variations, the, the genotype um, gen uh, differences within the groups of populations or races. Um, but actually between the groups of races, there are uh, very little genetic variations. These are not naked to the eyes, but scientists can tell. Um, race, IQ and the bell curve theory. Um, this bell curve the theory, the, uh, a well-known book uh, published in 1994 by these two uh, authors. Um, they try to find correlations between race and I IQ. And they, their main findings is that IQ is substantially influenced by both inherited and environmental factors. And it is a better predictor of many personal outcomes, including financial income, job performances, crime rate, 
uh, et cetera. Um, they also, uh, from the statistical analysis that they say Asian Americans have higher mean IQ than white Americans who in turn outscore uh, black Americans. And that's the gist of their findings. Uh, so there's this for and against um, arguments for that um, statement. For as that they uh, claim it is data driven. It is from they uh, they did a lot of statistical analysis from the National Long Long Longitude Survey of Labor Market uh, Experience of Youth uh, claim to be like statistically significant, thus it is scientific. Uh, against assumptions of this study um, that IQ can be reducible to a single, single number capable of ranking ordering people in a linear order, prim primarily genetically raised, essentially immutable. Immutable, like once you have the gene, it's hard to change. And this uh, criticism was made by Stephen J. J. Gould, uh, a famous well-known anthropologist. Um, AAA statement on race, that's AAA is American Anthropological Association, um, says there are more genetic variations within the racial groups than between the groups. Race is a social construct invented in a colonial American during the 18th century. And the statement is quite long. So I put a link here. Um, I can send you this uh, link. Um, that's the consensus of anthropologists um, that basically says it is a social construct. Um, not based on science as some of my slides also demonstrate. Let me see, uh, later on I will, uh, I'll send you this link through, um, through, let's see, am I in the right page? So if you just like uh, Google, uh, American Anthropological Association Statement of Race, you'll find it. I can email you the link. Um, this, uh, this quotation is from Declaration of Race and Racial Prejudice by General Conference of the United Nations. All human beings belong to a single species and share a common origin. They are both born equal in dignity and rights and all from all form an integral part of the humanity. So here is my uh, reflections on race, racial ideas and racism. Um, I think most of us, uh, me included, have stereotypical racial ideas like uh, some things like Asians are particularly good at, or African Americans good at, uh, Caucasians. Uh, we have stereotypical views, um, but I wouldn't label these stereotypical racial ideas as being racism, because if once you label it as racism, and make people very reactive and say, I'm not racist. And it also kind of cheapen the gravity of the concept of racism. Um, on the one hand, we need to be aware of our own prejudices. On the other hand, we have to be careful in separating what is the stereotypical um, ideas and biases versus um, hardcore racism. And I'm, I'll talk about that later on, how I would uh, distinguish these two. Um, the problem of correlation versus causation. So it's easier for us to make correlations 
Um, and sometimes we confuse correlation with causation. For example, um, Asian subgutting math, that's what you see as like correlation. You see a lot of um, Asian students um, have high scores in math, but does that mean they are born that way or their parents push them to do a lot of math problems, a lot of practice? That's the correlation, doesn't mean ca causation. Not, uh, there are um, some um, excellent athletics. Um, African-Americans uh, uh, excel in um, some sports, but that's also correlation. When we see correlation, uh, does that mean they, they were born to be that way or because they just have more practice in sports than in doing math? So we have to be vigilant when we see their correlations and don't confuse it with causation. Causation is very hard to really um, to understand because once you see a phenomenon, there could be many causes instead of just one cause, right? Um, so racism, um, I, I like this um, definition. Racism is any action or attitude, conscious or unconscious, that subordinates an individual or group based on the skin color or race. And this statement was made is made by the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. In the sense that um, racism, I think is more when someone in power to use the power to, to, uh, to subordinate, to exercise the power to uh, make decisions that based on skin color instead of um, someone's real competency. If someone has a stereotypical view, but not really acting on it, it's just a bias. If every stereotypical view and biases is labeled a racism, um, it just creates more reaction from people, oh, I'm not racist. Um, but I think we all should be vigilant about our biases but when someone is in power, use the power to act um, in a prejudiced way and to cause real consequence, then it uh, can be labeled as racism. Um, personally, I like to uh, move from the concept of race with ethnicity because race implies a biological difference whereas ethnicity implies a cultural difference. So from our current anthropological point of view, we are all belong to one human race, but there are um, different cultures. So if we move from race with ethnicity, we can still celebrate uh, diversity and differences we're, and we still embrace our human race. Let me see, for last two. Um, ethnicity, race, and subcultures. So um, I just mentioned uh, my preference to move from the concept of race to ethnicity. Uh, ethnic groups, and they are, uh, also can be considered as like, there are many subcultures, uh, not only race, but there are other like religion, or sexual orientation, um, subcultures. Uh, racial, <laughs> racial ideas of racism, uh, and I um, uh, want to separate our racial ideas as stereotypical views versus like real racism. Um, people of color. Um, this is kind of political, politically correct term that we use today, which I think prob it's problematic. Um, if there is a people of color, what 
is the other side of people of color. Caucasians um, is people without color. Um, and we never say people without color, right? We say people of color. So who is people who are not of color is like colorless. Um, so that's my take on it. Um, and my last point I want to make uh, is based on a book I am reading right now. Um, the author is a union psychologist. Um, union psychologist, I can also copy and paste. That's the end of, <laughs> okay. I try to move so I, you can see, but I can't. Okay, so this union psychologist uh, who wrote this uh, book called Integration, the Psychology and the Mythology of Martin Luther King Jr and his unfinished therapy with America. And uh, he, um, or the author highlighted the four um, points in Martin Luther King's um, vision. As, uh, one is faith, uh, and you have probably heard this quotation, the arc of the moral universe, although long is bending towards justice. So this gives us hope of working for a uh, more integrated, better future. Um, that's his faith, faith um, and hope. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Uh, love is central in Martin Luther King's uh, vision and uh, action. He said, as I look into your eyes and into the eyes of all of my brothers in Alabama and all of America and all over the world, I say to you, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. And his life uh, fully illustrated this. Um, and the fourth um, level is understanding. Meaning and the purpose of the civil rights movement, uh, love, suffering, and nonviolence, elevating them to powers that could save the world. Um, so we are still in that process of of fulfilling Martin Luther King's uh, dream. If we can um, keep on working on this faith, hope, love, and understanding, that's the first step of uh, overcoming um, racism, racial uh, prejudices, and working towards a better future for everyone. And that's all of my presentation. I tried to make it uh, within an hour. I think I did. Um, I'm open to questions. Okay, uh, unshare your screen, Jean, and we'll uh, get started with questions. Okay. And I'm like, though, first off, I did mute the two callers who were here. Uh, at star six to unmute if you want to join us in our uh, conversation. So now we will have questions and uh, I'd like to entertain the first question to open up. Um, I would like, Jeanne, I, I got a quick question and this is on a somewhat somewhat humorous note. Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to know if uh, you consider this picture somewhat racist. An Indian and African-American and Mexican women walk into a bar. Just kidding, it's three liberal white women. Well, it, it, it depends. I wouldn't consider it a ra racism because I think uh, in, it, I wouldn't consider, but I respect those who might consider it as racism because I think there is only one ra race. Right. And sometimes, sometimes not, not someone appear to be black is truly like, embody the black values, right? In, in a way, in my research and my 
understanding of the social disparities, mm -hmm. there is more of social economic um, divide ah. uh, than the ra ratio. Although this can be controversial because in a way, of course, there are more African-Americans that are in a lower social economic status. Right. But today we know there are a lot of poor whites mm -hmm. too, right? right? And the poor whites, there is a reaction against um, the values that put forward by Martin Luther King. So the so-called like race and a social economic class is so much well intertwined and so hard to discuss because we one concept, even race is difficult to come to discuss and <coughs> social economic class is also difficult. And that when the two are entwined, it just presents so much challenge to make it um, objective and not controversial. Okay, uh, oh, Jan, I, I liked your answer to the thing. I was trying to be a little bit on the uh, humorous side, if you know what I'm saying. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I get, get you too serious. Uh, I, I know, but you you did you did a nice answer to the question. Anyway, okay, Margaret, you're next. You got your hand up. Please unmute and ask your question. I'll lower your hand. Don't worry. Okay. Um, I guess I'm wondering if you think some of this, as I would call it, nonsense, will change as people are beginning to do Ancestry.com and discover their DNA. For instance, my uh, uh, niece by marriage proudly told me that when she dis she discovered that she had a small amount of African American uh, DNA, this lady is seventy years old. Uh, she was very proud of it. She's you know an LPC, well educated, worked in the Dallas College, saw nothing. I mean, she was happy about it. She just said, "I felt really good about knowing more about myself." Do you think? Uh, that some of this will change as more and more people realize that most of us who've lived in this country for centuries, whether we are black or white, are going to have, be of mixed heritage or mixed ethnicity. What is your opinion about that, Jan? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think in a long run, like Martin Luther King said, the arc of moral uh, universe uh, will is bending towards the justice, but they, they are always action and reaction. We are uh, now in this stage of reaction and pushback. Um, in, in like reality, if uh, more Americans do a genetic testing, uh, more than I would think like uh, more than probably 50% or even 70 or 80%, of Caucasians will find that uh, you um, have genetic genes from um, African Americans or Asians or Native Americans. Um, studies show there are very few uh, pure blood and that's just uh, uh, substantiated by, um, by research. Um, but then there are a lot of people who don't do that kind of in-depth um, studies or uh, do the genetic testing. Okay. All right, uh, Janice, you're next. You have your hand raised. Thank you. Um, Jian, um, I have many questions, but I'll just ask one. Um, I remember at a previous time you were here, um, you spoke about how you learned English. And I taught Russian. And once when I was in the Soviet Union, speaking to somebody else who was in a line that I was in, um, he asked me if I was from Siberia, uh, because I have a strange, you know, American accent. <laughs> uh, he didn't expect I'd be from the United States. Um, so I have been attending a class to teach me how to speak Russian like a Russian, and it means changing your mouth position. And when you learned English when you were a teen or maybe earlier, <laughs> um, I'm wondering how you uh, came to form 
English without very much hardly any accent. You mean you mean right now or before? Yeah, right now. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I I think a lot of it is practice. Um, and I've been in the States for over 30 years. Like I live, I, I mean, in the States longer than um, I was in China. And I have been a language teacher all my life. I used to teach English as second language when I was in China. Now I teach Mandarin. So I pay attention to, to language. Um, there is an uh, interesting theoretical question to what extent language uh, impacts the way that we think and cognition. Um, and that's another topic. I think it, to some extent it does impact, but we never know uh, to what extent <laughs> that it, 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 it does in, impact. Um, my, my um, it's, yeah, it's partly because of my job. I have more um, opportunities to um, speak and to read in English. I have like the more opportunities for me to speak and write and think in English than in Chinese now. Well, you're in Texas and you and you have not adopted a Texas accent yet, <laughs> but. <laughs> But if you've been here for about 30 years, you hear our accents all the time. So that so most helps. of us here in this forum don't have a Texas. Uh, I guess you're yeah, from Chicago. <laughs> yes, yes. <Okay. laughs> I have a Thank Texas you. accent. Everyone notices it. But you are we are so happy you've not picked that up, Giant. <laughs> all right. And then let's go ahead. It's Vicki and then Makeda and then Bob. You guys have all had your hands raised. So Vicki, mm -hmm. please go ahead with your question. Okay. I think you make a good point about race being such a useless concept that, that we should, you know, choose to refer to ethnicities in, instead. It's, it's just that sometimes I wonder if we're not, I mean, people seem to want to feel their group is superior to the other groups. Yeah. And in Scandinavia, sometimes I think I'd like to live there, but I wouldn't be white enough. But it seems there's less conflict and there's so much less diversity. And it might be a total bore, but I think there would be less conflict. And aren't we somewhat hardwired to be wary of those who are different from us? Isn't that part of the basis for the conflict? And whatever can be done, I, I, I just, I feel hopeless about it. Really. Well, yeah, uh, good question, good observation. I uh, have read something to the extent that uh, it might be hardwired for us to recognize differences, um, uh, group loyalties of your own group. But on the other hand, um, recognizing the differences does not equal the value judgment, uh, especially does not, uh, does, does not equal to um, racism in the sense that I know uh, we are from different cultures and my culture is superior to your culture. Most people, most cultures think that way. Chinese think Chinese mm -hmm. culture is superior and Americans think American culture is superior. Then if you come to Japanese, uh, uh, they think their culture is superior. So that is not particularly uh, exceptional. And the cultural difference, so of course, um, if I have to be uh, objective or scientific, I don't think any culture should assume a superiority. Um, we should um, learn and respect other cultures. Having said that, that 
cultural difference and biological difference is different. So uh, if it's cultural difference, you will say something like, when you adopt my culture, then you become my own group. But racism is you will be condemned as an inferior race because it's genetically determined. And that genetic determination of race is the foundation of racism. I cannot change my skin color. I can change my culture. I can learn, I speak perfect English. I know different cultures, but I cannot change my skin color. But I'm like, I'm not totally black, but I'm a person of color. I cannot change my person of color. And that's the, where the racism co comes from. And that's how the African-Americans find a special, uh, especially hard in, um, in being like on a par with the Caucasians if we consider biological difference as a key determinant. So that's why I propose that we say ethnicities. We come from different cultures. We recognize different cultures, but not we are not genetically different. We are all 99.9 .9 genetically similar, right? So that's a difference yeah. between racism based more on a genetic um, determinism versus cultural differences. Thank you. Okay, and then the Makeda, <laughs> please go next when you're ready. Okay, boy, I have a lot that I could say here. Um, I took some notes. There were some things that I agreed with, quite a few things, and a couple of things that I didn't agree with as much. But overall, uh, some of the things that you said, I've actually lived. And so, you know, you were, um, when you talked about passing, for instance, and you weren't sure if that was the correct phrase, that is definitely the correct phrase. And I remember my mother talking about how my grandfather, who was biracial because his father apparently was a slave owner and his mother was a slave. So he looked like a white man with blue eyes and very light skin, similar to, you know, many white people who I have seen or encountered. And so when she was a little girl in the 50s, my mother is 77 now, but I remember these stories from when I was a child. Um, she'd go places with him and she told me about how at one point, someone stopped her and said, little girl, is that, is that man bothering you? Leave her alone. And she said, no, this is my father. And she told me about how there were establishments that she couldn't go into. But of course, the family wanted to do certain transactions or get certain items. So she was a teenager and he'd tell her, stay outside. He'd go in, he'd do whatever he needed to do, and he'd come back out. So, uh, yeah, it's very much true that within Black families, and I think pretty much everyone should know this, we have different skin shades. And that is because of the miscegenation that happened within our cultures. And so from light skin to brown skin, which is what I would be called by most people um, who are Black, to darker skin, we are all considered Black kind of uh, snickered when you mentioned Tiger Woods calling himself Cablasian, because a lot of black people of my generation, I'm Gen X and older would sneer at him for using that term, simply because why shouldn't you be proud that you're black? I have two black parents. We're about the same complexion. Uh, we're all mixed because of slavery. And so just because you're mixed, the one drop rule that's what it's called, the one drop rule, does apply still within black culture. Um, it's really funny though, because if you really want to take it as far as they did in colonial times, even Russian Alexander Pushkin is black. He's what they called an octoroon, meaning that you're one eighth black. And so a lot of people might not know this, but there's some black history circles where they'll, where they'll say, hey, 
the Russian Alexander Pushkin, did, did you know he's black? So in this day and age, people might say that's taking it far, but in those times, it would be quite accurate. And really he should be um, relegated to the back of the bus if people in the society knew that one of his great grandparents was black. Um, and of course, there's a lot of mixing. And so there's a lot of that. A lot of people have some African-American um, heritage who may not know it. And most of us who are African-American know that we have some Caucasian heritage. Um, as far as Kamala Harris. This is a question I, period. So, yeah, so am so, I finished? Is my time uh, up? Sorry, I don't uh, want to monopolize question. the time. So we have a uh, rebuttal uh, time. So uh, right now, uh, I'm more interested in hearing uh, both your question and aspects that you disagree with me. So right. I can elaborate. The things that I did, uh, most of what you said, I agreed with. Uh -huh. I would say for Kamala Harris, I mean, a lot of these things are, uh, I mean, Black people, it really is a social construct. It is fluid. I like that word. My understanding is at one point, Italians were not considered white. Uh, possibly at one point, I know the Irish were discriminated against as possible um, that they weren't considered white at one point. It's all very political. It's all very much a social construct. And yet there are some biological elements of it, obviously. Um, and definitely black people are not just a race, but we're a culture. I mean, we have our universities, we have our churches, we have our customs. And so ethnicity is quite accurate. We are so both your, considered a race. So, and, so, so my question, let me give you a real question. You need a, okay, the question that, that this is, is a Q and a time. Surely, mm -hmm. okay, so the question that I have is, um, do you ident what do you what are your your um thoughts about uh, how your parents would or uh, other other uh, relatives that you have would feel about the way the Chinese were classified um, and how it was very difficult to classify them and how they were really treated as white or not white based on economic standing rather than <laughs> race. What do you think uh, your family members would say about the things that you've discovered about the way the Chinese were treated? Well, that's a very easy question. I'm, I'm the only one in my family who uh, immigrated to the US. All my other relatives, they stay in China, so they have no clue. Uh, I mean, everyone is Chinese in China, so they, they are all like, they, they, I'm the only ones. I never talk about this with them because they want to understand. Right. Uh, yeah. And I felt, felt in the beginning, I felt it was kind of strange that I become, I become a person of color because I never thought anything about my color. I'm just me. Like why, why am, am I suddenly acquire? Uh, a particular <laughs> description of color that I was not aware of, um, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm the only one who, 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 who immigrated, so I don't have that answer. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, okay. Um, and th th listen, thanks for, for participating, Makeda. We appreciate it, okay? And we appreciate you coming, so, you know. All right, Mr. Matter, you're next, I guess. Okay, uh, Gian. Um, so, if, if I'm if I'm gathering this correctly, you are you claiming that there are no differences in mean IQ scores between, uh, and we'll use instead of using black and white, we'll say Africans, Europeans, Asians, and Hispanics. Um. Basically, I would say um, that, that there's no dif difference because you've got mountains of data I know, for, I know, for years yeah. and years yeah. showing these very real differences. So I know that there's a, a, a data, but the um, the the assumptions of um, of the ability that we can tell. Um, from the tests um, is 
the assumptions itself may be questionable and skewed. Um, first, the, the Chinese who came to the U United States are selected. Uh, in, in like most of my friends have masters and PhDs mm, and their kids, they know like their kids will go to college, not only go to the college, they will go to Ivy League co colleges. None mm. of them would ever question their kids would not go to co college. So this is very selected group and also in Chinese culture. They, they do have I, to have a, they do have to have a certain uh, entry score to get in these colleges though, right? I mean, you mean in China or in the US? Well, either, especially the US. I, I don't know about China, but in 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 your in China, both in China and United States. So so I I just uh, want to illustrate that uh, both there's there is this uh, selected group of individuals um, and also the cultural value of book le learning. If you are good in book learning and if you are selected gr group, you you are most likely to do well. Whereas African-Americans, um, most of them were, came here as slaves. So they didn't have that kind of educational background. And I, I was made uh, fully aware now um, of their uh, large numbers of African-Americans their um, parents have never been to college and it is accomplishment for many of them to finish high school. So if we are talking about the, the Asians whose parents have been to best schools and the cultural values of education with, with the same um, the kind of tests that you have the um, black kids, African American kids to take, uh, their parents who have never been to college and they came as slaves um, and their culture uh, were destroyed as like being come here being laborers, not only laborers, but slaves. Um, they were well, not. You, weren't, weren't, you, weren't there so some? Like another, the, I mean, these are the the underlying. Um, these are the underlying factors in impacting how well they perform. Uh, I know, like like Obama. I read Obama's um, uh, biography. His his mother is a PhD anthropologist, and his mother woke him up at five o'clock and study. And, and he was like, always like performed very well in school. And his father from Kenya, also a PhD. So it's more in a way, social economic so, and so educational value. That's hereditary. hereditary. That's hereditary. When both of your, when both of your uh, parents are intelligent and then you end up being intelligent, doesn't that, doesn't that tell you something? So that's what I also mentioned. Correlation doesn't mean uh, causation. The co co you see the co correlation, but in terms of causation, there can be many factors of. The, okay, so not, let's take this on another. Okay, let's take this on another let track. Come back. So you have tested people in 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 China who were farmers um, for generations and never been to college. For example, they may not do as well in a test, right? Um, the, and I also said like the, the slaved uh, Africans that they didn't have opportunity. So yeah, well, slavery has been over for about 200 years if you haven't known, noticed that. Well, the, the lingering effect still has a big impact. Like I said, many of uh, African uh, families, they don't have parents who've been to college. They live in a neighborhood where most uh, people who don't go to college, whereas Asians, most of them who go to college and got graduate school. So this- well, I, mean, I, I know lots of intelligent people that didn't go to college. 
let's take this on a different, I'm gonna give you another question. Okay, let's say a uh, hundred people graduate from college with an IQ of 135, which is pretty smart. Because the average IQ is like 100, 100, 105 typically. So 135 is pretty damn smart. Mm -hmm. uh, Caltech, MIT, those students have a, usually have a 145. So 135 is pretty smart. Out of 100 people that take that, 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 that graduated with that 135, what do you think the racial mix is? What would be your guess? Well, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if there, there are a lot of Asians and Caucasians, um, the numbers, um, but again, the numbers. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you what the numbers are. Uh -huh. out, of 100, out of 100 people with the IQs of 135, 60 of them will be white, 30 of them will be Asian, about six will be Latino, three will be black, and one will be other, which is you know something you can't put your finger on. It could be an Eskimo or American Indian or something like that. So you've got 100 smart kids that just graduated from college. Only three of them are gonna be black. If Google or Apple hired these 100 graduates and put them into positions, you know, entry level uh, positions there. And then when it comes time to pick, pluck somebody out of that class of a hundred and make them a board member or maybe a head of a department of engineering or something, the, 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 the odds of any one person getting picked, it's already gonna be 99 to one against them. But isn't it unfair to say that it's racism that's causing the lower number of blacks and hispanics in these high level management positions rather than just you know the abilities they came in with and I'll just and just because they have a high iq doesn't mean they have other necessarily good per personality traits they could but i mean but they could be disagreeable they might not have a good sense of humor they might not be a good communicator i mean there's other things that could be going on, but even that, you know, you see where, isn't it really, it's not systemic racism. It's just a numbers game that when you've got people that are not, you know, you're just a lack of people that are scoring 135 on the test. You're, of course, you're gonna have fewer making their ways to the boardrooms in the, in the uh, top, top executive suite. Doesn't that make sense to you? It does and it doesn't. Um, when you say the numbers, we, we all can see the, the numbers. On the other hand, you don't know um, what's behind the numbers. We see the correlations, but we cannot say correlation equals causation. Um, right. There can be many different reasons for getting the numbers, not just one reason. Well, we can tell. We can tell when we by, by looking at these uh, at the at the at these mounds of data that the that the mean scores of IQ are different, and that's just the way it is. And aren't we, you know, tearing the country apart, claiming systemic racism, when in fact there's there is a hereditary. Hey, Bob, we're going to have to. Uh... Uh, difference more too. We'll, we'll come back to it later. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and th th thank thank you, Bob, for your contributions. I know we can get into some really good stuff. All right, Charlie, and then Makeda, and then Margaret, if you don't mind. So, Charlie, go ahead. You're still first. Yeah, thank you, Jan, for good talk. Um, I'm having a little problem here. You want to discard uh, genetically based definitions of race. Now, I'm recognized as a by the government as a equal employment opportunity complaint hearing officer uh, to adjudicate uh, claims of discrimination. Now, we have to enforce the Civil Rights Act of 1968. 
and using your social social construction definition. Now, if we, let's just say someone who appears to be black, a young man, uh, comes to me, and let's say he had been raised by two white people. So can he file a complaint? Because technically, according to what I've heard you say, he's a white. So how do we, what do I do? So tell me more succinctly your question. Well, if it's confusing right now, you, in order to file an EEO complaint using genetically based definitions of race, there's no issue. However, using, applying your new, new definition, I'm uncertain mm -hmm. I can represent that man. Okay. Okay. Because you yeah. say um, he's uh, adapted the, 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 I guess, race of his heritage. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, okay. I think I know your, your quest question. If, if we disregard uh, race, how would uh, someone from, um, say, African-American heritage to, um, to dispute, uh, to uh, claim uh, a racial injustice case? Is that what, you, what your question yeah, is? Yeah, I mean, actually, okay. if I was raised by African-American parents, could I claim discrimination? Um, According to your your uh, presentation, I, my, I mean, I mean, what whatever my position is, <laughs> it, it will not be adopted by the government. I'm such a small potato, right? So, so uh, that that you don't have to 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 be like a particular concerned. Uh, all I'm saying is. The reason for me to say that this has nothing to do with the real, like, um, um, say, uh, the court cases, things like, like that. That what I am say, saying is, eventually, I think that they, they are steps. So right now, we probably still need some um, some terms to. Uh, label different groups, but there's an echo. But eventually, uh, we should move beyond labeling of of race. Um, maybe I don't know how many years it will go. I'm not not in the policy making process. No one really asked me for that opinion. Uh, I think. Eventually, it is better to for us to move towards the understanding of cultural differences and diversity than saying we are biologically different. Right now, the concept of race implies biological differences, which is not scientific, neither scientific um, nor socially responsible. What do you, um, what do you, wait, wait a minute. What do you mean it's not scientific? It's genetically based. That's not science. I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting you. That's science. I think I have it's already biology. No, that if the science says we are 99% nine point genetically similar. And not only that, the variations between the, the groups like white, black, Asians, um, actually are smaller than the variations uh, within the group, say Caucasian, because the Caucasian is a large group. Group White people is like, not just like, just American or British, right? So you have <laughs> Russians or whatever. There are large group of white people and there are large group of Asians. There are large group of blacks. 
but but the way that we are thinking mostly in the United States, like black and white, how things are different. But if you look scientifically, um, and that's like uh, people who work in the anthropology field or genetic, like scientists, there is a consensus that that um, that there is only one human race, race genetic. Follow up. Follow-up question. Is that Senator from Massachusetts the Native American Indian? I'm not in a position to, to say particular case, cases. I don't know enough to, 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 to uh, make any ju judgment. Um, now I, I will talk more like a politician. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't make. Wasn't. I don't. I don't make a, 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 a assumptions on things I don't have a full, full knowledge of. Uh, it's just not responsible. I don't. I don't know. Um, I don't have all the information. I did never study that. 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 Um, I personally think. Um, I personally don't like identity politics in general. That's my, I think we should judge person by the person's quality. Like Martin Luther King said, said by, um, not by the color of skin, but by the character. And fundamentally that's the position we should move to uh, rather than playing identity politics. It is weak to play identity politics, not strong. If you know who you are, you are who you are, regardless of your skin color. That's my position. So I could represent that. You represent yourself. You represent who you are. It doesn't well, matter. I could follow the discrimination. Okay, uh, on, all right, Charlie, we're going to have to. Uh, I know again, right. we're, into, we're into some more controversy. So Makeda and then Margaret. Makeda, I know you got another hand up. So go ahead and uh, let's get, keep at this for a while. All right, Jeanne. Um, yeah. First of all, you did say that there's more variation within a race, so-called race, than between races. And so you and I, obviously, human beings are 99.9% .9 genetically similar. And so we could be more racially similar than me and another Black person. It possibly, yes. That's my, my question to you. That's what I, my understanding was with what yes, you were saying. That's, that, that's um, scientifically proven. Yes, I agree with you. And to me, that also kind of uh, hits in the face of some of this IQ stuff. First of all, is it also not true that IQ can change over time in a person uh, as, as people develop in their lives, it, it can change. Um, the other thing is I don't consider IQ to be the definitive marker of intelligence. Um, there is a lot of controversy around whether not only things like bias, but um, just because IQ can change. And um, I just honestly don't believe there's a human being smart enough to give another human being a test that determines definitively whether or not that person is, is smart. People can't even agree on what intelligence is. Um, I agree with you when you were saying that um, upbringing and access um, does play a big role in how people perform on tests. Uh, the tests that you use to get into college are not IQ tests per se. They're aptitude tests, the ACT, the SAT. They are very coachable. I know this because I have coached students myself and their scores have gone up hundreds of points. A lot of the um, SAT is based on vocabulary. Okay, now my mother didn't go to college. She's an intelligent person, but not extremely educated because of the times in which she was raised and the few, uh, opportunities that she didn't have. Someone, a child who is exposed to more uh, advanced vocabulary it's going to do better than the vocabulary on the vocabulary section of the ACT. A child who has access to higher math classes, uh, level math classes, is going to do better on the math section. So I completely agree with you there. I've experienced it myself. Um, Black people are interested in education. I'm not saying you said they, they weren't, 
uh, where I disagreed with you with when you said something about Obama was raised by white parents so or a white mother, so maybe he was raised white. I don't look at it that way at all. I made sure my kids were focused on STEM just because I wanted them to buck the stereotypes. And my kids uh, have done very well, gone to some excellent colleges. My oldest daughter actually did get into MIT and I spent a lot of time coaching and training. She has two college educated parents, so she did better. I did better than my mother, but I was at a disadvantage not only because she wasn't as well educated, but also because of the school system I was in. And I see that firsthand. I was raised in a poor district in Detroit. My kids were raised in an upper middle class neighborhood. The education systems I see firsthand are very different. My kids have had much better access and so they got into much better schools. Yeah. So do you have a question for me? Uh, this I thought I, I asked you a question at the beginning just uh -huh. to follow the rules, but I'm finished now. Okay, yeah. do you have another question for me? <coughs> no, okay. I'm finished. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, Makeda, thank you again. We're gonna, pro like I said, we'll each get a chance in our rebuttal period to spout off for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, Margaret, let's go. I just have a quick question. Based on something Bob was saying, I didn't quite understand. Uh, I gathered that 100 students who had graduated from Ivy League schools were tested, maybe IQ wise, uh, and that you know there were a very high percentage of the higher the higher IQs were among what percentage wise a high percentage. Well, what was the composition of that 100 students? How many of them were white to begin with? Black, Asian, Hispanic. I mean, if, if the percentages were very low, and I may have misunderstood the question, among the people of color, so to speak, versus the whites, well, were the whites not in greater numbers to begin with? I was just confused by the question. I may have misunderstood it. So, Margaret, is the other question to us, Bob? Well, it was really, I just wondered if you understood it. Uh, uh -huh. what he was talking about, and maybe Bob can elaborate. I think he's got his hand up. He does. Yeah, just probably clarify what I was confused about. Okay, Bob, um, I think we're, um, she asked a question. I know your hands up. So, Go yeah, that, well, that's, that's, that would be the distribution of, of, the, of the population of college graduates with 135 IQ. Uh, that's, that would be the, the rough distribution of them. Uh, you know, 60% will be white, 30% will be Asian, which is like way out of their percentage of their proportion of the population. Uh, and then, uh, again, six would be Hispanic, three would be black, one would be other. That's, uh, that's what I just read in, uh, Charles Murray's new book called Facing Reality. Okay. All right. Now we've had several people ask questions. Who else has got a question in here? Um, Do you have one there? Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the callers' names. Uh, can you state your name and ask a question? Beth Ford. I'm, I'm sorry. Can you speak a little louder, please? Rom. Rom Bassford. Okay, please yes. ask Thank your you, question. Jim. Yeah, the question is, uh, if people tend to socially decide how to use their their society, their immediate society, the people they're going to relate to by the difficulty of communicating with them, which would be lingual or uh, identifying by social class or uh, by the kind of way uh, go as neighbors. Uh, there, there are all sorts of ways of, 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 of your own age or, or sex or uh, 
it's not all going to be based on uh, skin color or other racial features. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, if you, you read uh, something like, uh, oh, uh, Race and Class in a Southern Town uh, by uh, Pollard, um, I think <coughs> the 40s or late 40s or the 50s uh, uh, and used uh, in my sociology uh, course at the college on South. Um, let's see, uh, or uh, something more recent like uh, Jared Diamond's uh, book of uh, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, uh, which goes into why uh, uh, some black people in uh, New Guinea, uh, up in the highlands, uh, find that it, all these white people uh, dominate uh, <laughs> Their uh, cargo, uh, the, the, that is, uh, the things that they want to acquire, uh, and uh, whatever they can to get. Uh, and trying to explain to him uh, uh, this uh, uh, Jared Diamond uh, went into a a long story about the development of the human race beginnings in Africa uh, uh, and the the, uh, the cosmological that is the the climate and land uh, and the, the need, the ways that people uh, hired. Uh, Rob, can you put your food. can you put your question in one sentence and wrap it up? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, I'm. I'm the, the proposition that uh, on. Uh, Racial or inherited features, uh, or whether they're skin color or anything else, uh, but uh, those are uh, the some uh, features. Do uh, identify with people on other bases, but also those uh, physical bases that. Maybe more genetically uh, uh, connected. Can I make a comment? Uh, my roommate. Uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, Curtis Sanders. Can I make a comment, please? Oh, yeah. comments are coming Curtis, later. Pardon? I'm I'm Brahms' roommate. I am an African American uh, guy who was raised. In, on the south side of Chicago, but I, I've lived on the north side. I, I have a very uh, views. I can say I've been. A hey, would you guys speak up a little bit, please? A little louder. Oh, I was saying I've I've been acculturated because I was raised on the south side, but I was never. To dislike myself, but I have a, uh, I have physical handicaps with, which made me aspire to do good. School. I went to a handicapped school also, but I see some of the racial differences. I see some of the cultural differences, but I also. Had friends and half friends that are, you know, 
I have a Philippine friend, I have white friends, I have black friends, so I see those differences, cultural, I see ethnicity, and I see uh, theological, uh, theological, uh, and uh, you know, dealing with your blood type or yeah, your, your genetic, uh, excuse me, it's kind of hard to get get started with a question, but I'm just saying some of these things that separate us shouldn't. You know, like the young lady said, we are all humans. And we have to learn to love that. Yes, we can embrace our cultural differences and learn from each other. You know, so thank you for letting me make a comment. That, that's no understand. Okay, that's no problem. Gian, do you want to react to it real quick? I mean, what Bob and uh, his roommate said? I think uh, the... <clears throat> I have to reiterate in a sense that the when we talk about race, we imply that's the genetic difference, like uh, physical difference, uh, separate one group from another. When we talk about um, cultures, uh, ethnicity, we talk about more learned behavior. So from uh, more like current consensus from anthropologists um, is that um, our behavioral differences is more cultural than physical because it's learned behavior. Like if I were, <clears throat> I, if I were uh, still living in China or if when uh, a Chinese uh, often got adopted by, by, a, by, a, by American couple and a race in, in the US, then this uh, adopted girl, usually Chinese girls adopted here, um, they, their behavior will be more American than Chinese they look like Ch Chinese because you cannot change your skin color, but the language and culture will be more like the, 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 the native, uh, whichever the country adopted as a young, uh, from young. So it, it's uh, behaviorally, we can all learn, culturally, we can all learn. So in a way that in that sense, I, I think from a more idealistic point of view that we should embrace uh, embrace people from different backgrounds as like one human race and celebrate different cu cultural heritages. Right, right, right. That's a more real uh, idealistic point of view, which in reality, yeah, it's yeah. hard to um, uh, implement at this time but I would rather start from an idealistic point of view than starting from assumption that we are so different. We are so different and there's nothing we can bridge um, the differences between different groups of people. I think we have to start somewhere. Right. And like you said, idealistically, I'd be okay, but we have to get rid of things that we feel that separate us. You know, I have to get, I have we to do have to stretch ourselves a little to. And we have to. Oh. Who okay. we are and who our neighbors are. <laughs> okay. We, yes, we learn how to be from our parents, our teachers, and our surroundings as we grow up. That's hard to get rid of. Mm -hmm. so oh. I don't want to be, I tell Abraham a lot. I don't want to be mad. I don't want to be sad. So I've had a lot of challenges. 
period. We all have a lot of challenges in life. I think that's what life is about, to overcome our challenges that we are presented with. Okay. Um. All right. Uh, Jian, Jian, do you think we ought to, any more questions from anybody else? If not, we'll go into rebuttals. No. Okay. Um. Now I, I know Brom, you've you've spoken and your roommate's spoken. Uh, I know we can get into a rebuttal period. I'll give everybody about five minutes to uh, start. So who's got a rebuttal tonight? I know Charlie usually does. Raj, you want to do so, say something or? Let's take our speaker. All right, go ahead. All right, now uh, I, I said Margaret and Frank. Is you want to rebut or do you have a question, Margaret? Unmute. I'd like to ask a question too. Okay, well then Janice and then uh, Margaret and then Janice, go ahead. We'll keep it going for a little while then. Okay, um, you know, no, no, I Margaret's, missed... Margaret's next, Margaret's next. Okay. Oh, you want me to start now? Yes. Well, or, yeah. or you got a rebuttal, or you got a rebuttal? I got or... a rebuttal. Okay, I have a then, question. Then we'll take okay. Janice's question and then we'll go into rebuttals, Margaret, okay? And That's you'll be the fine. first. Already. All right, Janice, go yes, ahead. Thank you. Um, you know, I missed the first few minutes of the, well, half hour of the presentation. So I don't know how much Jean might have addressed this already. Um, but the law, you know, redlining, Chinese Exclusion Act of, 19, of 1882. And, um, and I went to the Smart Museum, um, I don't know, a few weeks ago. It was uh, an exhibit about... Um, racism. And one of the resources there, well, there were many resources, but one of them was the book, The Color of Law. So my question is, uh, how has U.S. law created racism? That's a very big question. I, I, I don't remember if I showed this slide that kind of address part of your question. Mm -hmm. uh, you ask uh, if I uh, talk about the Chinese Exclusion Act. Mm -hmm. um, I, I probably didn't, uh, I missed this slide so and I can go back. Um, so the, the first wave of the Chinese came to the States was because of the gold rush, like many immigrants from Europe as well. Um, I started in the uh, 1850s. And then after the gold rush, um, they um, found a job in building the transcontinental ro railroad. Uh, they played a pivotal role in um, building this transcontinental railroad. And dying and from that. Dying from, from that. Uh, but the, they, because they, um, they were willing to uh, work hard for very little pay, um, some uh, white uh, workers um, were not happy about that. Um, and also because they were culturally uh, so different from the Caucasians, there was a backlash against the Chinese. So the Chinese Exclusion Act um, was enacted uh, by the US Supreme Court, I think, in 1882, and that was the first exclusion act ever in, enacted to immigrants and was against the Chinese. Um, and that also kind of indirectly answered the question that Bob raised. Like now, uh, the IQ test usually points to Asians and Chinese as having the highest IQ test, uh, even higher than the Caucasians. But at the height of the Chinese Exclusion Act, they were considered, of course, inferior race. They were considered uh, inferior in terms of intelligence and uh, behavior, everything else. That's why the Exclusion Act was enacted and it was not um, um, abandoned until, um, until really like, um, like partly it was relaxed uh, a little bit after the Second World War, but it was not totally abolished until 1965, until 1960s. That's why you see like a lot of new 
new immigrants from Asia. And before that, it was like only 100 um, Chinese were allowed to come in the US. That's the, the this exclusion act. And that's why um, the, the numbers in Charleston uh, dwindled so much that you couldn't see any uh, older uh, Chinese community and their children were merged into the black, uh, maybe white or black, they would know Chinese until after 1965, until 1970s. Um, so, so our understanding of different groups were very much colored by our uh, cultural, historical, economic uh, pressures instead of their inherent IQ. Why did, why did we think they were inferior in the 1880s and wanted to do this Chinese exclusion act? And now we say they are the smartest. They are still who they are, but our perception of them have changed. Uh, and of, after this exclusion act, after the uh, very uh, uh, rude treatments of the Chinese, that they were dispersed to different um, cities and towns, become farmers, small business owners, restaurants, gross, groceries, and laundrymen. In South Carolina, Charleston, uh, the restaurants and gross groceries were already uh, being, um, that business opportunities were taken by Germans and Irish. Um, so there were very little opportunities for the Chinese to do. The laundry uh, was like usually done by women, uh, women of color. Um, so there was like a business niche for Chinese men to work long hours and do a professional job um, of um, like doing the um, business suit and some silk, some high-end kind of laundry uh, for, for them. So that's the only business niche available for the Chinese men because the Caucasians wouldn't want to take that kind of job. So that's kind of the slide I actually didn't show and answer part of your question about the Chinese Exclusion Act. Oh. Okay, so uh, if you want to unshare, we'll then go to rebuttals if you don't mind again. And uh, now uh, let's again, let's thank our speaker one more time. All right, Margaret, uh, I'll give you five minutes or whatever you need. So uh, please go ahead and get started. <laughs> okay, first, um, oh, there's a number of things. Um, uh, for, I don't know that people know this, but um, Thomas Jefferson married a woman um, who brought a slave with her who was in fact her half sister because her father raped this girl's mother and she came and she was a slave because the slaves were, uh, they had the status of the mother. So the, his daughter, so he had her bring up his daughters and, um, and she was older than they were, but but she was their slave essentially. But then what happened is, I think it was after his wife died that he went to this woman whose name was, uh, I think Sally Jennings. Um, I don't remember, but he had like seven or nine children with him with her, and um, and he did not sell any of his own children, which many slaveholders did because they were wealth, um, but, but he didn't sell them. So when he died, he, um, well, actually when he went to Europe with his daughters, he took this uh, one of uh, Jennings daughters, his and Jennings daughters with them. And so she was one of his children too, but she went as a slave of uh, his uh, daughters. So then after he died, he freed all of his children. And, um, and I'm not sure what happened to the rest of the slaves on his plantation, but at any rate, he freed them. And this daughter, because actually she had a European education in a lot of ways, she passed because she was 75% um, was white essentially because of the heritage of 
her mother and 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 her and her father. So she passed, and as part of her passing, she cut off all interactions with her family, and she disappeared into the the culture. And there there was a woman that I came to the Newberry Library here in in um, Chicago and gave a lecture on that because she wrote a book about it. It was very interesting. Anyway, the other thing is that race has always been a social construct. And in this country, the black, after the, uh, the almost successful Bacon Rebellion in 16, whatever, 1670-ish, um, the colonial government to prevent another gathering of the working class that came very close to overthrowing the colonial government, did a divide and conquer thing. And what they did is they took away rights from uh, people of color, the blacks, the, 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 who were freed slaves, the, uh, the American Indians who were, a, who were part of that colony in Virginia, um, and who were, but it was mostly Anglo-Saxon uh, people who were indentured servants that came over and were freed after their indenture period and given by their contract with the person who paid for their passage, um, farmland and, and animals and, and, and grains to plant and a gun. But the other people, they could not own a gun. They could not vote. They um, had a bunch of other restrictions. And if a white woman married one of those people, she assumed the status of that person. And in, flat, in fact, if that person was a slave, she became a slave of the person that owned him. So all of these laws about miscegenation were written during that period. That was the period after, after Bacon's rebellion that a, a white race was identified even. We, you didn't have that before in the law. It was not, there was no word like that in the law. So they were identified as a white race and they had they, they had kind of special privileges because they were white. And because of all of that, the attitudes between the groups changed. Before they were more, much more of a unified group and shared the same kind of lifestyle. But after that, they did not. And that is the history of it. So then we had the black codes and the slave codes and all of those things before, yeah. and they weren't freed in the 1700s with our own revolution. And until the Civil War, they weren't freed. And, the, and if a black person escaped to the North, they had to be by law returned to the white slavers. But at any rate, all of those things happened. And then after the Civil War, after the reconstruction, when it, Union troops occupied the South and ensured the fact that people could, <coughs> own, could excuse me, own land or whatever, go to school, whatever. When, they, when the re reconstruction ended, all of the things that we see in the South now is a, appalling oppression of, uh, of uh, people of, of African heritage. They, um, they couldn't go to school or the schools they went to were inferior because even though people were paying taxes, even though the black citizens were paying taxes, their children could not go to white schools. They, they, they were segregated out of the schools, the, 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 the black schools were under-resourced big time, just like we have in Chicago now, where the South Side schools are under-resourced. So that, that all, that's a whole history that's just continued. After, uh, and so you had segregation and Jim Crow in the South, and then when you had the civil rights legislation, then you had stuff, and after the Second World War, you had things like redlining, where there were no bank loans in, in black communities, there was uh, segregation of people who, you know, they burned down their houses if they integrated a neighborhood. So people didn't really didn't like to die and have all their stuff burned up. So they tended to stay segregated, although some didn't. The North Side has areas of, of multicultural neighborhoods. So, but all of these laws and, and really traditions were, in, were enforced. The, the uh, covenants and, and land property ownership that said only white people are, you cannot sell to, to uh, Negroes. And so all of those covenants that you can still find in historical research on, on a lot of property deeds in Chicago, as well as across the, the Midwest, 
the renaissance of the clan after the after reconstruction was over and a building of all of those appalling statues that were supposed to honor civil war veterans who were confederates who were actually rebels and traitors and the people who established the southern states were responsible for a war that killed more people more soldiers than any war in the history of this country and more people than a um, number of uh, any war, all of the wars before it put together, there, the number of casualties in the, in the Civil War was higher than that of 620,000 people, which we, we didn't see uh, before or even since. So, um, and, and uh, uh, the, the oppression in segregating people and under-resourcing schools and not letting property develop in overcrowding neighborhoods where people were crammed together, um, you, you know, it just and and lack of health resources. When I was in nursing school, we we or in in my graduate program, we looked at uh, studies that people had done in Chicago that taught that demonstrated that the medical care, the health care on in Southside communities was just not there the food deserts where people couldn't even go get healthy food to eat. You know, all of the lack of transportation, the fact that they cut out a part of the, of the else that go down there that could take people to downtown without too much problem, they cut out part of that. They don't have the public transportation available in areas that use public transportation because people can't afford to have cars. So that cuts out a whole bunch of employment opportunities and all of those other things. <coughs> so, you know, this, this whole systematic, systemic racism that has totally oppressed and totally changed a whole group of people who are identified as black. So, you know, this a business about you're comparing an apples to apples is bullshit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank we appreciate you. it. All right, now, who, uh, who else has a who else has a rebuttal? Bob, I know you're kind of chomping at the bit, unless he's still here. Oh, Charlie's got his hand up. All right, Charlie, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. I can wait. I can wait. Go ahead, Bob. All right, I'll lower your hand, okay. Charlie. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. Well, uh, first, um, uh, I got to just clear up a few misconceptions. Um, Oh, shit. There's there's a lot of misconceptions that uh, that oh, IQ shit. tests are biased. Well, there's I think I just of... accidentally removed Charlie from the chat. I was meaning to lower his hand, so my apologies. Um, anyway, so there's all these misconceptions about the validity of the tests. Sorry about that, well, Charlie. There um there there's all kinds of different tests. They there some measure vocabulary, some measure. Uh, math, some measure facial relationships. Um, okay. Can you, hey, can you, Tim? Can you, can you squelch that hyena down there in the lower right hand corner? I'll, I'll. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm gonna mute. Okay. She, she's muted. Okay. Good. All right. So, anyway, uh, all this has been covered. If you read, uh, there's some good books you all should read. Uh, one of them is uh, Making Sense of Race by Edward Dutton, D-U-T-T-O-N. He goes into quite a, quite a bit of detail in that. Of course, the bell curve is the classic you should read. And then Charles Murray's new book, uh, Facing Reality, which all he does is he just talks about the two truths that we need to face up to to help the country right now. And that is that the, you know, what what is the, the uh, high incidence of black crime uh, and God knows in Chicago, those of you who are in Chicago know that, that we live, you know, under, under this horrible, you know, black violence culture, people getting murdered, you know, there's about six or 10 get murdered every week and 50 or 60 get wounded. And of course, the, 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 the newspapers and the politicians like to call it gun violence, but uh, everybody knows that it's black violence, black and somewhat brown. Of violence, and uh, of course, this is all. These are all correlated to IQ, and uh, 
and it's the lower part, you know, the lower leg of the, of the IQ. And IQ is co closely associated with things like empathy and uh, thinking of the future and, uh, and uh, having uh, uh, control over, over uh, you know, making, uh, uh, you know, quick irrational decisions and, you know, things like that. Uh, th this is, you know, this is all related to IQ and this is why we have this black violence problem. And this is not just in the United States. This is every country that has black populations when, in, when they're in any, any kind of uh, city over, you know, certain amount, you know, of any sizable city. You, this seems to, uh, to uh, you know, go down quite a bit when you have smaller cities with smaller, smaller populations uh, of, of, the, of black and brown people. But, uh, you know, in the large cities, you know, Chicago, New York, Detroit, uh, you know, Baltimore, Washington, DC, uh, these crime rates, you know, the uh, blacks commit, you know, these violent crimes, like at a ratio of like eight times as great as any anybody else. Uh, eight times as great as white people and stuff. So when we hear all this nonsense about, oh, it's systemic racism that, so that's the policing, you know, that's doing all this. Well, yeah, it's because they, that because they do most of the crime. That's why they're the ones that are most in jail and most arrested. You know, it's as, it's as simple as that. So that's that's one of the realities we have to uh, address. And the other reality, of course, is that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, with the hundred college students, that uh, uh, when you have uh, uh, this kind of disparity in IQ, uh, you know, you're not going to have the level of achievement. It's not going to be, you know, well, we hear in the newspaper all the time. You know, you're not going to have equity. Just because blacks are 13 percent of the population does not necessarily mean that they're going to be 13 percent of the cardiologists or the airline pilots or the uh, boards of drawn to boards of directors of Fortune 500s, etc. Like that, it's got to do with the uh, uh, you know how, what your IQ is. Now, when you're only 13 percent of the population and you have a lower mean IQ to begin with, now to get to reach out to those people in that higher end, the 125s, 135s, the 145s. Now you're really you're really getting down to some slim numbers. So that's why we have only out of 100 college students with 135 IQ, for our, say a college graduates, that you're only going to have three are going to be black. So you know you're going to have less people getting in those high paid you know positions, and so that's what it is. It's not systemic racism. All this, all this ancient history you guys are talking about, all the redlining and all that, and the slavery and the Jim Crow, that's been over for 60 years, okay? So anyway, now back, back onto the test, some of the stuff about tests. So there's tests that all this has been ruled out. Uh, SATs, ACTs, college entrance exams of all different kinds, they all, they're all very highly correlated to IQ or what, what we call, you know, G. Now they've done all, they've done tests there's, or studies. There's something called the Minnesota twin study where, where they took twins that were raised in different families. If they, if you take a, you take a set of black twins and one's raised by a black family and one's raised by a white family, let's say a, an affluent white family and one's raised by a poor black family. Yeah. The, the one that's raised by the white family will have a little bit higher IQ, seven or eight points maybe, as the child is growing up until they reach about 18 or something. When you retest them when they're about 35 and they're 30, when they're adults, guess what? Their IQs are, are the same again. So there's, okay. there's so, so, you know, uh, IQ is composed of, you know, a, you know, some environment, but also a whole heck of a lot of hereditary. And, uh, so those, those, that's, you know, things like that come out of these studies. Now you might, if you're interested in why this happened and I, you know, you can, some people lo loosely put races in just two categories, sun people and ice people. So sun people are the black and brown people. 
and the ice people are the white and the yellow people. So we split off from the black and browns and then the Asians split off from those. Uh, and the thing is when the, you know, the theory that uh, is put forth in Dutton's book, and I don't know if he conceived this, I think he probably picked this up from other books. He, he teaches anthropology in Finland. Uh, because living in a colder climate it required uh, a lot more forethinking and uh, things like that, uh, it was a hard, lot harder to live and took more planning. What was this selected for, you know, selected for intelligence. So your people got smarter and smarter you know, through the generations. When you when you live in a you know warm climate that doesn't have these pressures of winter coming and how harsh it is, it's quite a bit easier to survive. And there there weren't those demands put on the cognitive demands because you you know all year round you you had you know low hanging fruit all over to pick up and abundant wildlife to eat and things like that. Uh, so it was kind of a much easier way to get by and. Uh, and there, so therefore, intelligence wasn't as selected for as much. So that's in general the two two broad uh, ways to look at it. Now I didn't mention Ashkenazi Jews; they are really yeah. the top of the heap. But uh, I guess for some reason they're not really nobody. None of these writers really include them uh, as like a population. Maybe because they're such a small subgroup, and there's really like three. Uh, groups of Jews, and there's Ashkenazi, there's Shepardazi, and then there's the Ethiopian ones. Now, the Ethiopian Jews, their IQs are pretty much uh, not different, much different from Ethiop regular Ethiopians, which is like the average might be like 85 or something like that. Um, the Shepardazis are, I think, pretty much, they're pretty much normal for where they live, uh, maybe a little, maybe a few, few points higher. And then the, the highest ones are like the 120, right. 127 are the Ashkenazi. Okay. But anyway, I highly recommend uh, reading okay. those three books. If you really want to go into the details, read Making Sense of Race by Dutton. But okay. you should read the other other two well by, by Murray as well. All right. Uh, Makeda, you get, I guess you got your hand up. You're ready, to, you're ready to go next. You're set. Unmute. Don't okay. forget that. Yeah. Um, can I, can I, yeah. Okay. Go I ahead. wish I had known earlier that yeah, there we'll, was. We'll rebuttal. get you next, Raj. Okay. Okay. So I just wanted to say a couple of things. I go to political message boards, so I've heard some of the things that this gentleman is saying previously, and uh, I think he's got the wrong notions about some things. Um, first of all, there are 40 million Black people in this country. And if you take the number of murders that happened in this country last year, and you do the math, you'll see that black people represented less than a fraction of 1% of the murders. So if we have such a high propensity for this type of violence, then why is it that 99.99% .99 didn't commit that type of violence. Do the math, 40 million black people, I, and I don't remember the exact number, but maybe 20,000 murders, do the math, a fraction of a percent, kind of makes your argument about how we're so violent because of our genetics ridiculous. There's a difference between a rate and a percentage and percentage wise, it's less than 1%, it's a fraction of a percent. Just do the math. You're really good at math, right? Because you think you have such a high IQ, I guess, but no, I don't wanna be snarky. It's just a bunch of nonsense and it's all ego driven and it's really sad. Also, if you look internationally, you'll see many African countries that have a lower homicide rate than you know, some European countries even. It's just a lot of nonsense, seriously. All right, did you have anything else to say, Makeda? All right, Raj? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, Thanks for uh, saying, okay, Raj, go ahead. Okay. 
Come and get you, Charlie. Okay, please, please, in advance, forgive me if I sound anti Semite or anti racist or racist. Forgive me. What a hug was that Bob Matter. I think he knows better. Okay, he has intelligence, sure, and he has experience, and he had lived in Chicago and knows well to, to sell us that kind of crap. Okay, I mean, uh, I was about IQ. I was in University of Utah, and I, was, I suddenly become hard shot for some of our region. I was very popular, very intelligent. Everybody is very intelligent. So one day, the president of vice president of university asked me, Raj, how come let's take your IQ? You know, you should sound like a very high IQ person. So I went to counseling center and give the test, fill out all those things, you know, MMPI, IQ and interest test and everything. And then I say, well, send a test to my vice president. He got the test, he called me and said, Raj, you are mentally retarded. Oh. Say, <laughs> you know, I say, he say, he say I, we don't know what happened. We're trying to figure it out. Why IQ is so low, like a mentally retarded person. Okay. And then, then there was a lot of things going on within different departments. And they say, I've been only one year here. And uh, my SKU knowledge is very little. It, lots of IQ, IQ tests as an American framework of mine. And I do not have my vocabulary that much and uh, I, I, I could not do it, you know, and that's what happened. And then my, my uh, aptitude test came out. So I was the vice president of manufacturing company, head of chamber of commerce, and this is just something that's in jail here, you know. But, but that's what happens with IQ sometimes, you know. Black, black people have a lower, like, lower prosperity and a lower number of, they don't go to a grocery store that, that has just so much SKUs and they go to smaller grocery store that don't have that much goods. That even makes a difference. Okay, anyway, the, the talking about, uh, I think I should lean, I should give her very good credit because uh, she, she has been scientific, she been restrained, she stayed to the folk, and she gave very, very good details of the issue. And we, we very rarely have a, this kind of speaker who understands the issue, who articulates, who stays to that, you know, and, and, and I, I really thank you, I appreciate you, and thank you for coming. The, the further, go, further going is that, uh, look, if a, uh, if, uh, Bob Matter want to try to tell me that Jewish people are very smart. I don't think they know how to form a government in Israel. I don't think they have found a solution to dealing with a Palestinian in over 60 years. So I mean, there is, there is something, and, and, and all the study, all the, everything I know, I know a lot more about Israel, believe me, okay? And, and everything people, I don't think they're nicest people. They're, there are one million people other day. I, I, I post out the whole article on them from North to South. And one million people are second class citizens, white, white people, second class citizens. Okay, how is that? Okay, let, let, let us talk about the about the, the this issue about uh, the America. And uh, we are not, what we are not doing is that, that a black people, if all this, all this money spent, one billion dollars would have been allocated to black and uh, poor white people's edu kids' education. We have to up-to-date education system in this country so that poor people get as much, as much money as a white people get. If, if someone in Northwest gets a, gets a $20,000 $20, per student, black students black student should get the same too and get educated. If a science laboratory is a very good in the Northwest, Northwest side or Southwest side, it should be good in the South side or West side also. And this is not happening. And, 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 and the second thing is that there are lots of racism. Let, let's, 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 let's 
say it very frankly. Racism is that in a different way. You know, the, the, for a number of years, Walmart is closed by to me. We did not have no black employee there. Now suddenly we had a black, black employees. Not only labor is sorted, but uh, the first batch of black employees they got, they were not very good, okay? And Walmart learned and they trained them on a, how to work. They trained them and a, and a black population is more getting more educated. And now those black employees are as good as white. And, uh, and the, the main situation thing is that if black employees mobility in increases, their education increases, they, they, and they get better. I mean, look, we have we have black mayor. Okay, and, and she's pretty good. Okay, she's, she's perceptive, she's knowledgeable. So I mean, for somebody to say that, the black people don't have IQ, come on, that's the crap. It's because Obama had IQ because he was from foreign country. No, that's not it. Black people have ice cube, black people do not have opportunity, do not have deception. They don't have $5 million that the rich Jewish men go and give them to Harvard and uh, they get admission. Guy doesn't have no crap of knowledge and Harvard will pass him and graduate him and he'll go away and say, hey, wow. You know, it doesn't have, black, and uh, black, Indian, Indians are pretty smart, they are doing very well. Right, right now, Jews, Jews are doing very good because Jews have lots of influence. Indians and Chinese are doing very well because they have education, they are hardworking, they are focused, and they like their job, and they, they, they get along with people. Okay, it works. And uh, I'm sorry, we 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 have a Jewish people keep on telling me that there are lots of highest level of crime. Okay. I posted a I posted a couple couple of weeks back, two or three weeks back, and uh, the, the big lawyer he says big Jewish lawyer he says all the anti-Semitism things are bullshit that they're made up by Jews. Jews. They're made up. They're not really one. And, and, and then Bob 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 matter had to say that well you know this black people are not. I don't know. He knows black people around. I do not know. I don't know if there are synagogues or if they invite lots of black people, then what's going on? But I mean, language, look, number of attacks I have, I have support at college of complexes by Jews. It's a, it's a strongest racism you can express among the educated people, among the educated, successful older people. So we have to do something okay, about Raj. it. Okay, I'm done. We have to do something about it. Okay. Outside, at a, at a black community. All right. All right. Charlie, anybody else? Or Charlie, do you want to go next? All right. First of all, let's thank our speaker. She did a really good job of assembling materials and doing your research. We appreciate your coming here tonight and putting up with us and taking our best shots. I'll be eclectic as usual. I'm going to cover five issues. Uh, first of all, uh, I gave a lecture on the Transcontinental Railroad, including I gave a lecture to the Chinese community here in Chicago. Uh, from what I can ascertain historically, um, all of the employees of the Transcon returned to China. Uh, now, the thing is they were organized by work groups or gangs. So all they had were the names of the leader of the gang and they didn't have the members of the, individuals. Now, a lot of them also may probably it may have gotten jobs with other railroads since other railroads were in the process of being constructed, which is also likely. But uh, there's no record we can trace of anyone who actually worked on the railroad. I wanted a little bit of factoid. Any uh, Chinese employee who died while constructing the railroad, the railroad would pay to have his body sent back to China for burial. Number two, uh, I heard a lot of IQ. I used to give tests for us. I, I started by the Chicago Public Schools for testing. I went from school to school uh, for academic assessments. So as I understand, IQ is what IQ tests measure. Uh, it is consistent over life and genetically based. Uh, for one thing, that's probably the only thing Bob said that was correct, I think. Uh, another thing, uh, the third thing is, 
at the college complexes, we've had several generations of people attending. When I joined, there were a great many people from the civil rights movement of the 50s, most notably um, Kay Myers. Now, Brian Basford went down to Mississippi for Freedom Summer. He got arrested down there. He was uh, uh, active in it. And most also, some of you may remember J. Quinn Brisbane. Quisbane was arrested 22 times for civil rights issues. As a matter of fact, I was at the protest in which he was the last time he was arrested. Uh, but uh, that generation, and I learned a lot from those people regarding the civil rights movement. Uh, number three, Bob, hunter-gatherer cultures all face the same pressures of survival. And it doesn't matter whether it's tropical or Arctic, uh, hunter-gathering cultures are essentially the same uh, and face confronted with the same issue of securing sustenance from the environment. Uh, so that, that one you can put to rest. Um, as I indicated in my questions, I think some problem is if you let these academics and anthropology have their way, is that it would be impossible to enforce the Civil Rights Act of 1968, and you effectively would nullify it. And you might as well, along with that, any of talk of affirmative action. Um, that's uh, just my own sideline on this. Uh, uh, yeah, I, it's, I think this thing called unintended consequences. Um, the, uh, let's see, what else? Now, the thing about getting rid of race altogether, and no, there's, I don't know, is, is there such a thing as an American ethnicity? I mean, we're, we've got so many different cultures that an American identity, I believe, has emerged. And last of all, I wanted to tell you that I was the victim. She wants to replace race with ethnicity. I was the victim of ethnic discrimination many years ago. I was going out with a young lady. She was real pretty, but her parents didn't like me at all. And they said, I'm Lithuanian, third, second, third generation. But despite that, I heard her parents remark that they didn't care for me and they were, the reason is they wanted their daughter, they said, to marry an American <laughs> instead of me. Which I, I still remember that. That wasn't nice to say, but okay. anyhow, thank you again, Jeanne. It was a very good talk <laughs> and all good comments from everyone. Thank you. All right. Is there anybody else who's got a rebuttal tonight before we uh, let uh, Jian Lee have the last word? All right, Margaret, I know you spoke once, but if you want to say something again. No, I, I just have something short, and, and it is that, that uh, Bob in his uh, identification of Jewish uh, divisions really murdered the last, the name of one of them. It's not Shepherd or Z or whatever. He said it's Sephardi. So I, I don't know where he got his material if he doesn't remember what they said, if he's mispronounced <laughs> it because he didn't read it, I don't know. But it's the farty, any, which right. gives you an idea of the level of his knowledge of the whole thing to begin with. So that's, uh, which is whatever. And, and the other point I wanted to make is, what we're saying is not ancient history. All of these attitudes and segregation and all that is now. It's because uh, uh, Ahmad uh, Aubrey was a lynching. It was because people were ha are still being lynched. There was a whole concentrated effort on it uh, of lynchings during the uh, from the uh, late 1890s or so, all the way through till after the Second World War, where it was really common and thousands of people were lynched and they were lynched because they were black or in very small number of cases because they were sympathetic to um, African-American aspirations and equality. So, um, or they were Catholic. That was the other little group that was lynched. 
so um you know this is it's it's now it's now it's not it's it, it this is not hundreds of years ago this is now and it's why we are still segregated in this city in chicago because i'm in chicago and right. it's why we are still segregated in detroit and in los angeles and in uh new york and in and you know most major well major uh cities across this country so it's now it's not 200 years ago that's bullshit Okay, Vicky, I know you want to say something, so go right ahead. All right, Vicky, you got okay. your hand up. So yeah, okay, it'll be short. It'll be go ahead, short. Vicky. Yeah, I, I would like to see racism go away, and I would like to see prejudice go away so that, you know, Charlie wouldn't have such an experience. And I had another friend who couldn't marry this woman because her parents didn't like Jews. Um, but I think we're a long way off from getting rid of prejudice in general, and I just don't know how much um, it's a part of our of human nature. I, I'd like to think it isn't, but I don't know. But I always look forward to the speaker, and I always uh, find her talks interesting and even surprising. So, well done. Thank you. Just, okay. Thank you so much again. Margaret. Yay. Okay. I have a real brief, <laughs> <you> brief, <laughs> brief something to, to add to this discussion before GN takes her last thing. You know, I'm I'm I've often wondered, you know, we have seen so many people blasted because they've been in blackface before. You know what I'm saying? But what about those people in whiteface? You know, she's been called Keckles the Clown. So we'll just uh, leave it at that. You are such an idiot. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Tim. You're an idiot. Let me say something. Let me say something. I, 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 I had a feeling that was coming with that picture. <laughs> Can I say something? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. All right. Uh, the Ahmad Armory, Arbery trial. He was lucky to get off killing uh i mean i mean the white people were lucky to be convicted of killing a black person because that rarely happens in america what and also rittenhouse if he had been black and killed three two white people i think he would have gotten the electric chair uh, i think he would have been the the verdict would have been a lot different if a poor and uh rittenhouse was a poor white guy killing two white, poor white kids. If he had killed a rich white kid or what rich white person, I think he would have been put away for a long time. So Rittenhouse should have been Westinghouse. No, I think. Uh, you don't get it. It's all right. No, I don't get it. Thank no, no, you. The, the term Westinghouse was uh, used when they had the Battle of the AC and DC currents. And uh, let's go to all GM. right. Let's 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 go. Okay, uh, GN, make your last comments, final comments tonight. Um, can we I appreciate do, uh, everything? Thank you, thank you. Uh, can I do a little uh, experiment? Um, <laughs> I like to ask. Um, I like to ask everyone if you care if. Um, if, if you have any stereotypical views about Asians or African Americans or certain Caucasians, um, and I don't think I don't equate stereotypical views about other groups as racism. I think it's kind of racial ideas, and it's important that we are aware. Um, and it's kind of fun to to know about and to be. Uh, that we feel to free to talk about um, and not being labeled. If we label such, then we uh, prevent um, people to talk about it uh, freely so we can kind of um, discuss and to understand. So I, I just want to do this experiment and don't feel shy if you have any. I think it's uh, quite normal for people to have 
stereotypical views about different groups of people, if you want to share? Well, I, I think my, my own uh, upbringing was with, uh, my mother was from Kentucky and, and she was born in 1912. So they, they were really segregated down there and uh, black, and there were lynchings there. And she talked about how the black people had to get off of the sidewalk when a white person came by to get out of their way. And they weren't allowed to go in the stores and try on clothes. They weren't, you know, there was just a lot of oppressive practices that, um, and, and the schools and all of those things that were, that marginalized them and, and made it not possible for them to do a lot of things. Most were sharecroppers who didn't own property but worked as basically serfs on other people's property. Um, and there were many more white people who, there were some white sharecroppers, but a much greater population of, of the uh, agricultural people who were black were uh, sharecroppers. But do you have any stereotypical views about? Oh yeah, you know, I do and I have to. Well confront so, myself all okay. the time. No, no, no. I, I'm just interested. I want to hear about stereotypical views uh, that we have. Yeah. That we talk about, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I guess uh, the stereotype, if I see a group of black men, I really have to stop and think. Mm -hmm. Now, I, you know, my normal, if I was just uh, acting automatically, I'd like go inside somewhere. Mm -hmm. But that may not have anything to do with what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, uh, but anyway, that's, and that's, and that's the uh, that kind of stuff. anyway, that's the first question they always ask. Employers give one day seminars to all employees, and that's the first question they always ask. They go around and get employees. The thing about employees, employers, and anti discrimination training is. They don't really care about discrimination in the workplace. What they care about is being fined for allowing discrimination within the workplace. So they want employees to take a class and most importantly, to sign a document that they attended when you go in. So if the event there's an EEO complaint, they can say, well, we tried, but you know, the people won't listen to us no. and see what happens. Now, Charlie, the other thing I wanted to add I, was- I want to know if you have any stereotypical view, views. This is the uh, question I ask. Okay, and I want yeah, to know I, uh, let me finish. I, if anyone has, has like your personal uh, stereotypical views. That's- well, To be honest with you, Jean, I've had mine changed drastically over the last 20 years or so. so. What, did, what did you have or what do you see? Well, the thing is, is that, you know, I maybe it's because I'm in a group called Postmasters and everybody yeah. is kind of aspiring to be better themselves all the time. But, yeah. you know, I have found that every Black person I've met, every Asian person I've met in that group, they've all had um, a real propensity for success. They've all been very smart and adroit and they, I have no racist bone in my body. Um, I found that I, if I judge them on all their characteristics, you know, the race and as particularly the Indians and some of the Chinese I know are very um, smart, very well spoken. They all want to have a little bit of ambition. And uh, I mean, I'm not going to condemn an entire race just based on some things. I find that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I know I get a little bit of a smart ale. I can do some things like crazy to keep the things, get some laughs or whatever. But, you know, to be honest with you, you know, I've oftentimes said something to Janice like, you know, well, Archie Bunker says I'm all for women's liberation, but wanted to have them stay home to cook and clean. You know, that's not the way I honestly feel. I honestly feel that I want to give people the benefit of the doubt. I want to make sure that I can make a friend with them. Now, like I said, if I'm walking down the street and I see a bunch of black men congregated together, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit uh, scared because I'm scared of them stereotyping me. But, you know, once I think you get to know people over time, you do okay. You know, Mexicans, uh, anybody, you know, 
And I find that it's a lot easier to get a lot better if you don't prejudge people. And, you know, yeah. like I said, I do have some stereotypes like everybody does. I thought Asians were really smart and all this stuff. And but yet at the same time, oh, they are. So do you, okay. So, so do you think you have changed uh, over the years because you are exposure to people from different backgrounds? Well, the different, the people I know from different backgrounds. So have you changed? Have you changed? I think so. I, I honestly think so. Exposure. Well, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 you know, I was, a, you know, I used to always think I'm never a racist, but yes, I did notice I was somewhat racist in my twenties and thirties easily. I mean, you know, um, it wasn't, uh, overt, but you know, definitely was more scared. And I think as I started working with more people at my job at UBID, uh, I actually found, I think some of the laziest people were some of the white car co-workers I worked with, you know? Um, and if there's any type of discrimination and that type of thing, you know, I found that uh, some of the people, um, you know, particularly in my own race were probably some of the worst characters I ever saw. And, you know, that I hate to say that, but, you know, it, it, it can be that way, but, you know, over time, I think that, uh, <laughs> yeah, Janice saying what I write has indicates you have discrimination all over you. I don't think it's discrimination, uh, Janice. I think it's called sarcasm. <laughs> well, if you, uh, you look at uh, what, what's happening over time is that we are sorting, the population is sorting by IQ. The, the, the smart, the college professors, the doctors, the high level politicians, they're all intermarrying. You're, they're they're mostly living on, you know, it's bi-coastal. They're mostly living in California and you know New York and the East Coast, Washington D.C. And all these people tend to marry each other. You know, they have small families. And they're they all Democrats. To, they belong to the same country club. Well, that's the thing. And don't you see these white elites? You know, for for the most part, you know, white elites, um, Hollywood celebrities uh you know again you know college professors and things like that and they feel that their feeling is that well, well you know blacks are poor they can't help it because they had slavery and so that they can blame everything on racism so it's not their fault but but these poor whites these poor whites that live in coal miners in virginia and you know the tobacco farmers you know, and the truck drivers, they look down on them. They figure well, those guys are just, you know, those are just, those are dumb hillbillies. And they can look down, you know, look down uh, on the, them. That's caused the a lot of uh, animosity. Okay, I have a question. Um, How is the, in China, is please, can you shut that hyena up again down in the, in the corner? So I can uh, you hyena uh, yourself. Stop um, it, Bob. You so, crazy. Listen, so, I have a question. How they so this, is a, this is a real Jewish that, people anti-Semitic in China. That, uh, I'll let you go next, Ileana. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the toxicity. The toxicity. The toxicity uh, of affirmative action. So <laughs> this is a this is a stereotype that's very dangerous, and so what's happening is you know now when. Um, you know, when there's, you know, somebody sees a black person in a high level job, now they're wondering, did that person get there on merit? Or did that person get there because of affirmative action? Now, they just released a study the other day that, like that. that white people, white, white, white college students on their admissions uh, forms are lying and saying that, that they are uh, Hispanic or black uh, or any other protected group uh, to, to improve their odds of getting in. So there is, there, I do agree with you. There is systemic racism in this country, but it's systemic racism against whites and Asians that are you know kept out of school, like school admissions. And I believe there's a, <coughs> pardon me, I believe there's an ongoing case of uh, Asians that have a class action suit or something going on because they're really affected bad, badly by this. They're prevented from getting into the good, you know, the better schools. And the thing is, I think it was and United Airlines, I believe, one of the big airlines, just announced that, you know, they're they're going to hire 
uh, like, you know, they're going to have like, uh, you know, some X percentage of their pilots are going to be black, which is, again, scary to me. Do you want to get on a plane that's being flown by somebody because they're black? Or do you want to get on a plane that's being flown by somebody because they're qualified to do the job? Okay, Look at the mess we have in Washington, like um, Kamala Harris. Okay, okay, yes. okay. 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 So, like the leading clerk. Can I say something? They can be both, Bob. They can be both, Bob. Okay, let's let Margaret go next. She's got her hand up. Margaret, go ahead. Can, can I say first, uh, Tim <laughs> ahead, actually asked me uh, to kind of say the last few words. Yes, yes, and, yes. And I wanted to, to ask a very specific question. And I hope people who respond, because we're kind of nine o'clock. So I hope people who respond will be more like being reflective of your own stereotypical views instead of like, uh, like we are having another round of rebuttal <laughs> or q and I, I am asking, I am asking us to reflect on our stereotypical views of other group only when we are aware that we still have our stereotypical views about other group can we um, start work on it and be uh, agents of change. It's easier for people to quick to jump into judgment without reflecting our own uh, biases. And I am still, I'm, I'm guilty of having my own biases as well. But I think that's the first step of for going forward, right? So I hope um, people who like want to talk being more reflective on your own instead of another round of rebuttal. Tim, can I, can, can I speak? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, we got Margaret, we have Vicki, but Rod, do you guys mind I, if Rod says something? Or I have a question. Speak? Tim, I have a question. Go I ahead. do mind that, yes. I, I, I think we should go in order, actually. Okay, okay, then we'll go Margaret. Margaret, I would, yeah. Margaret, Vicki, Raj, and then uh, Ileana. Okay, Margaret, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, John, in answer to your question, uh, I see it now as more socioeconomic stereotyping. And you and I are in the same city and Chicago has the same problem. We've got scads and scads of homeless people, people who are desperate, no shelter. I mean, all sorts of socioeconomic problems. And yes, it doesn't make too much difference to me what the color is. Uh, I am more inclined to feel anxious and uh, on my guard if I happen to be in an area or a situation where I'm confronted. I may give somebody something through the window, a dollar bill or something, solving nothing. But uh, today, I can give you a quick example. I was on Abrams Road. I saw an Aldi's. And I was about to go in it at Northwest Highway. And then I remembered that there had been some criminal actions in the area. And I just looped back around and went to the one down on Gaston Avenue, which most people would think would be in a poorer area. And oddly enough, when I was loading my stuff, here was a street person, all of his possessions. He happened to be African-American, but I would have had the same concern if he'd been close to my car, whatever his color. So I think for me, the stereotype, stereotyping tends to be socioeconomic. And that may be the way of the future for many other people. Next. Okay, uh, now Vicki, you're next, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, to answer your question, John, it, it would be yes. I'm, I'm not necessarily comfortable in sharing every detail of every um, but yes, uh, and in terms of cultural prejudice and stereotyping, um, I'm German, Swedish, Slovak. I, I, I don't have any negative stereotypes about the Swedes, but to me, the Germans are obsessive about paperwork and, and to me, rather patriarchal, uh, 
probably not so much now, but that's stored in my head. And there's, I don't know what I can do about it. And um, Slovaks, I think of as illiterate peasants. Um, Asians, they are the group that is at the college where I work from opening until closing, regardless of IQ, I think there's a very high cultural value in academic success and they study constantly. And um, yeah, the Natural Mer National Merit Society was called the National Asian Society. And I think I certainly, um, my Jewish friends place a real high value on academics. And I think probably after time and generations that will result in a higher IQ for all that matters. Um, African-American, if I pull up to a stop sign, I think they will take their time, more likely take their time crossing the street. Whereas when I, when a car is waiting for me, I run. Now, whether that's entirely a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, but I, I, I have this in my head. So that's that. All right, Raj, you're next. Uh, the, when I went to New York City and I had a lawyer friend, he, he was a lawyer from Harvard. And uh, we, we start talking that which group we should, we should follow, copy for an for a Indian community future. And guess what? We decided Jews. We said they are smart, they are well educated, okay, they know business, and I still like Jews the best. Okay, the, the, the thing, I'm comfortable with talking with them. In a business in New York City, almost all my contacts were Jews. And and uh, I was introduced so well that if I go to I go to Jewish designer or a Jewish uh, wholesaler clothing, or a, or a Jewish guy who is, who is uh, still making ties. And I can go and I'm welcome everywhere. And, and at a great time, I, I, I can't complain. They, I mean, they give me the key of the, key of the, whatever they knew everything. I can go and I say, my, my, my mentor was there. He'll, he'll go to somewhere and a guy says, and, and he says, he's the son I have. Okay, it's like that. My son, father and son relationship. He had two daughters, no son. But but uh, wherever I went, I, I I had a good relationship. I can talk to them. I, I can feel very comfortable with them. And uh, and I tell you, I still like them. I and uh, and uh, it's too bad that at uh, college of complexes we have a, we don't get along. Okay, but but I mean, I mean it, it is a painful. But but I mean it just 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 it has gotten so bad, okay. But I never thought that. You know, at Chicago I had good relationship. It's actually actually the 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 Chicago Jewish organization that that helps the new immigrants. And I I had at their request I had two guy I had two guys for immigrants who wanted some help. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, and then. Uh... Ileana, you got something to go ahead. Please add your comments. I guess, yeah, I just have question. I just have question. How is in China question about anti-Semite? Like, uh, with Jewish people, do you have synagogue? And if it's so, can you tell me a little bit more? And about like how Chinese treat Jewish people in general? Thank you. Okay. This is a question outside this uh, presentation. So I like to, um, my question is for us to reflect our own prejudices. So uh, I, we can talk about your question after we close this, right, Tim? Right, 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 no problem. So I, think, I think I was just making a, a closing uh, remark and then we can, uh, okay. Close, and then you, we can talk about anything. It's just okay. uh, has to, my the to the to the more to the target, and not just like dragged to 
<laughs> any directions. Um, I love my stereotype. So I, I was thinking about the, the stereotypes that reminded me of a conversation I had with a, with a friend. And I, I, uh, I said, what do you think um, Asians are good at? And he says, oh, uh, like math, doing math or academics. And what, what are the uh, African-Americans good at? Oh, they are good at, in athletics and sports and maybe music. And then I said, what are Caucasians good at? And then he stopped and he couldn't think of any. He says, maybe we're good at nothing. <laughs> so so I, I mean, it, it's just such a broad, like Caucasians, like uh, Rajiv talking about Jewish is also Caucasian. So these are just kind of like awareness. I think um, having self-awareness is the first step of uh, uh, making us less biased and prejudiced without the awareness of our own um, possible uh, biases and prejudices. Um, mm -hmm. we, uh, in, we tend to blame others and not look at deeply at ourselves. Um, so that's my, um, my reflection on this topic as well as um, I agree with Margaret. So my personal preference is not downplay the identity politics, but pay more attention to the root causes of uh, inequity, discrimination. I, I think it's more um, of social economic um, uh, issues. Um, of course, African-Americans in general um, get large proportion of being in a lower socioeconomic status. But as I mentioned, they are poor whites um, too, that the society and we as general need to pay attention and need to um, help everyone, uh, not only based on race, but rather based on socioeconomic status because they are wealthy Blacks as well, they are wealthy Asians and they're poor Asians as well. So instead of looking at like race as a main factor, we need to look at more at the roots of who really needs help uh, regardless of skin color. And that's my position, thank you. Okay, at this point then what I'm gonna do is uh officially adjourn the College of Complexes. Wish all of you a good night. We will stick around for the after party, but as of this point, I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>